In the West, men lived their lives under a lot of different legal systems, tribal law, local law, manorial law, and the law of the central or would-be central state fought a continuous battle for recognition from the countryside, from the provinces, which took centuries and didn't really get settled until quite recent times. Here, for instance, are great landowners from 6th century Italy who were a law unto themselves. But in the East, there was only one law, and that Roman law emanated from a single source, the ruler. Even the decisions of the councils of the church needed the emperor's approval. This is what has been called Caesaropapism, a political system in which the head of state is also master of the church. And the patriarch, the bishop of Constantinople, lived in the shadow of the imperial palace. When Constantine died in 337 with his heir far from Constantinople, the embalmed remains of the dead emperor continued to rule the empire through a whole summer and autumn and winter, with couriers reading their messages before it, ministers making reports to it, and courtiers seeking audience before it. It's important to realize, however, that even this macabre image of a ruling corpse had its roots in a long past. It was simply the triumph of the Hellenistic view of the emperor's lofty position, a view which had developed in the East since the days of Alexander, which the Romans had taken some time to adopt, but which the emperor Diocletian explicitly claimed in Rome at the end of the third century. And it was very useful because it lent the Byzantine Empire a sort of authority and stability that the old unified empire never had. It did not matter anymore whether the emperor was elected or if he was born to the purple or if he seized power because his throne rested upon more solid foundations than worldly processes could ensure. He was the anointed of the Lord chosen from birth to fulfill the will of heaven. And since Byzantines believed that promotion to rule came solely from God, the imperial throne was open to everybody, peasant and noble, to scholars and to unlearned men, the only condition being that the ruler should be an orthodox Christian. Leo I in the 5th century had been a butcher. People in Constantinople used to point out the stall where he and his wife had sold meat. Justin I in the 6th century was a poor swineherd from the countryside who first appeared in the capital with bare feet and a pack on his back. And then one day his nephew left the family village to join him. His name was Justinian and he became emperor in 527. Phocas, who ruled in the 7th century, was a simple centurion. Leo III in the 8th century was an odd job man. Basil I in the 9th century was a peasant, probably a shepherd from Macedonia. And Michael IV in the 11th century was a servant from Paphlagonia on the Black Sea. But once a man had become emperor, there was no constitutional method by which he could be deposed except a successful revolution. And here again, the fact of success set the seal of heavenly approval 
upon the man who, had he failed, would have been a mere usurper and would have been punished in the most terrible ways. The Byzantines knew that Jehovah had transferred his favor from Saul to David. They believed that God would withdraw his support from any ruler, and then you would know it, because the ruler would fall. And with this belief, revolution itself was incorporated into the body of constitutional practices. As the German historian Mommsen said, Roman government was an autocracy tempered by the legal right of revolution. Out of 88 emperors who ruled in Byzantium through 11 centuries, over one-third would be usurpers and as many died in violent circumstances. Poisoned, stabbed, strangled, beheaded, starved, tortured to death, or simply blinded, which was considered more humane. As one result, it became particularly important to emphasize the sanctity of the emperor, his distance, his untouchableness. The more vulnerable the emperor in fact, the greater the efforts to make him appear invulnerable in principle. This is Constantius II and his empress who ruled in the fourth century. This is when the empire is most threatened. In their time and throughout the third, fourth and fifth centuries, and this is when the personal position of the emperor is least secure. This is when the imperial ceremonies stiffen and the distance grows between the ruler and his subjects. A spectacular megalomaniac kind of drama is devised both to enhance power and to make up for the shortcomings in this power. You can see this if you look at the mosaics of the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora, stiff and splendid in the midst of their courtiers, their posture reminiscent of the unmoved mover, the highest power in the cosmos. Although it was very important that the emperor should impress upon his subjects this feeling of divinity which might help to preserve him from an undignified end, it was equally important that he should impress the barbarians, friend or foe. This was rather more feasible because barbarians were less sophisticated. So imagine the arrival in Constantinople of a barbarian chieftain from the steppes, from the desert, or even from the underdeveloped countries in Western Europe. He finds himself in this terrific maze of streets and concentrated humanity. He is taken over by imperial officials who look after him every day, every hour, who show him the sights, and who finally take him to the palace for an audience with the emperor. 